Last, we want to talk about the cell envelope. And the cell envelope is going to be a layer around the cell that is going to be in between the internal contents and the external components that we just looked at, the, uh, the surface coatings, like the glycocalyx, and then even the flagella and fimbriae and things like that. So really, I said last thing, two more things really, the envelope, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's inside of the cell. So just real quick, let's go back, refer back to our visual reference here. So we've worked our way all the way down to these three layers right here. Okay, so we're looking at this yellow, dark purple, dark pink, light pink. And we want to look at each one of these somewhat individually and then also as a whole here. And then again, lastly, we'll talk about what's inside the cell here. Okay, so these three layers are collectively referred to as the cell envelope. Um, each one has its own component and each different types of bacteria, that is, have different makeups of each of those three layers. So some bacteria, for example, have all three layers. Other bacteria have only two of those layers. And then in some bacteria, one of the layers may be a little thicker, a little bit thinner, maybe a little bit longer, a little bit skinnier, uh, or a little bit shorter rather. So there are differences in each layer and then how each of those three layers can even join together. So again, we're looking at kind of a broad thing here and kind of the general characteristics of the of the uh, entirety of it, the cell envelope. Okay, So the envelope, you can think of the envelope as kind of like the skin of the bacteria, kind of like the coating. You know, we know our skin has multiple layers and it's not just this you know, flat sheet, it's kind of this multi-layered thing. So think of it like that. It's a very loose analogy. Okay, so the three layers are the, the cell membrane, the cell wall, and the outer membrane. And that's in order from closest to the, to the inside, working to the outside. And you refer back to that figure again to look at that one more time, and you'll see the layering there. So this is closest to the inside, working to the outside. <clears throat> I rearranged the order here, sorry. But let's take a look at the cell membrane first here. The cell membrane is going to be what comes closest to the inside of the cell. The cell membrane is a very thin layer of what are called phospholipids, and what they do is kind of regulate what comes in and out of a cell, and they more or less are kind of like the gatekeepers of the cell. In fact, make, go ahead and make that analogy. Think of cell membrane, kind of think of it as like the gatekeeper of the cell. You know, gatekeeper, it's a series of little things that all kind of collectively allow things to move in and out of the cell. In fact, let's get a quick visual on that here. Here's a cell membrane. So it's a here's a good 3D image. It's a, a layer of these what are called phospholipids. Phospholipids. Here's an individual. So these, there's the head of the phospholipid, and then there's these tails, and you get two sheets of them lined up where the tails facing inward, and then you get these things embedded within them that are called transmembrane proteins, or sometimes called membrane proteins, and this is what allows things to move in and out. So the phospholipids act as like a sheet, almost like a wall, that m keeps most things from just simply moving in and out of it. But the proteins then will kind of act as like the gate within the wall to allow certain things to pass both in and out. So here's another look kind of showing the same thing. So you get a variety of different things happening here, but at the core of it, you've got this phospholipid layer and proteins that are like little gatekeepers that allow things to move in and out. Now, this is how all cells are. I wanna, let me just state this here. All cells have a cell membrane. This is a, a fundamental part of all living things. It's one of the key requirements that a living thing has to have in order to be considered a living thing. It's one of the reasons why viruses, for example, aren't considered a living thing because they don't have a cell membrane. So this is a very, very key aspect to all living things. All living things have some kind of membrane and they all look and function just like I described a second ago. Okay, so that's, I want you to recognize what it is, slightly what it's made out of, and then the fact that this is a fundamental part of life. Now, the way in which the membrane is surrounded 
by other factors is where life forms vary quite a bit. You and I, by our, our body, as, as animals, you and I's body cells, for example, are surrounded by a very different substance called an extracellular matrix. We don't really have a cell wall. We don't have a cell wall. We don't have an outer membrane. You and I have a totally different exterior outside of the cell membrane compared to bacteria. And that's really where life differs dramatically. As soon as you get outside of that membrane and kind of what are the other factors that go with it, everything starts to vary very greatly right off the bat. But at that just its existence and that kind of core function is very fundamental. So when we talk about bacteria, what you typically will find just outside of the membrane is the, the cell wall. And the cell wall is really there to help reinforce that membrane. Let's go back to the membrane here real quick. Another thing about the membrane that you need to recognize is that by itself it's very weak and is easily disrupted. It is not a sturdy, solidified structure it's almost, you can almost think of it like a bunch of rafts in the, in the ocean all kind of pushed together, floating in, in tandem. It's almost the way to think about it because it's really a very fluid thing. And uh, these, these membranes really need some kind of additional support to go with them. And this is where, again, other organisms will vary in how exactly they do that. Uh, but with bacteria, one of the fundamental ways that they kind of help support that series of, of phospholipids, the cell membrane, is through the, the generation of, of the cell wall. So the cell wall is this extra layer composed of a different substance. Uh, the substance is called peptidoglycan. We'll talk about that here in just a second. This extra layer uh, that is going to help reinforce the, the cell membrane. And you can almost think of this as more like a chain link fence type material or like kind of a metal uh, mesh type substance, a wire mesh almost. Because what the wall is going to do is it's going to help trap and surround that loose kind of weak membrane, going to keep it all together, and it's going to act as an extra layer around that, that, uh, that cell membrane. So first of all, with the next thing, peptidoglycan is what the membrane, is, or the cell wall rather, is made of. So cell membrane is made of phospholipids. Cell wall is made of peptidoglycan. I should say the phospholipid is the main foundation. It also says protein here, obviously. But the, the main foundation really is the phospholipids. The cell wall, pretty much the entire foundation, is, is called peptidoglycan. So what does that even mean? It's a loose translation. Uh, a peptide is... A, a short is a is a short protein is what it is, and that's the term peptido comes from the from that reference to a short protein, and then a glyco glyco or glycan is in reference to sugar or a polysaccharide, which is what we mentioned earlier. We were talking about the uh, the glycocalyx or the uh, the capsule and the slime layer, so similar type of substance here. But what happens here is you have a combination of the two that function together as a unique molecule. So it's kind of like a hybrid molecule. Here is a quick image. This is not really all that good. Let me find a better one here. Here we go. Peptidoglycan, you've got the peptides here. These are the short little peptides. And then you've got different sugar molecules that connect them together. So it really almost does look like a chain link fence if you actually kind of make that analogy in your mind. You've got kind of one set of substances going laterally and the other one's going across horizontally or vertically, vertically and horizontally rather. So they kind of cross link each other. Now, you can get multiple layers of this, so as bacteria create the cell wall from this, they can stack different layers on top of each other. But it's kind of this sturdy, meshy type substance, and that's what peptidoglycan is. And that's what's going to make up the cell wall, which comes just outside the cell membrane. The last part then is called the outer membrane, and the outer membrane is going to be unique to one type of bacteria. And so let's go ahead and get into that part here, and let's go ahead and differentiate that differentiate two types of bacteria based on this last term. So this outer membrane is a, is a feature unique to only one kind of bacteria. 
So there's bacteria that have it and bacteria that don't. And what this does is it kind of sets up two major divisions of bacteria. One that we refer to as gram negative, another that we refer to as gram positive. Okay, so that's kind of what we're getting at here. So it's called the outer membrane. Here's a picture showing the difference between these two types here. So on the left, we have what's called a gram positive bacteria. The gram positive has the cell membrane, as all living things do, made of the phospholipids and the protein. It's going to be at the base near this nearest the center of the cell, as it is in all organisms. And directly attached to that, you have then this peptidyl glycan layer here, which is the cell wall. So this is just kind of a you know kind of a very general view of what the cell wall would look like. And really, what you have here are multiple layers of peptidyl glycan. So let's go back here. Here we go. Uh, this is not a very high resolution, but it's showing you different layers of this peptidoglycan substance here. So there's multiple layers where this is stacked on top of each other. So think of it like multiple sheets of this um, chain link type of substance. So with gram-positive bacteria, we, we have the membrane and we have a, a, a thick cell wall made up of multiple layers of peptidoglycan. And this, this characteristic is what defines the basic concept of what we call a gram-positive bacteria. So the idea is that we have different types of bacteria. We, we've talked about them in terms of shapes and arrangements and flagella. Uh, we've talked about them in terms of you know, S layers and, and slime layers and capsules, all these different characteristics. And each one makes a bacteria slightly different from another, obviously, right? But this characteristic here is a broader and slightly more encompassing characteristic. So it's another one of those characteristics, but it's a kind of a more significant difference. Like this is a fairly fundamental difference in different types of bacteria and one that actually has a lot of relevancy. Now, I don't want to just immediately go into what all that is, but recognize that this is something that we will talk about over and over when it comes to the lab. We'll do tests and different procedures that will highlight this. It was called a gram stain, for example. And, uh, and this will be something that we talk about with different diseases later and how there's actually a different context in which gram negatives can affect someone who's infected differently than a gram positive can. There are actually even different medications that would be used against gram negatives versus gram positives. So there, these are really fundamental differences that, that you need to be able to draw back on this information later in order to understand that. Okay, so please Please make sure that you understand this, and I will definitely ask you questions about this. You know, there's not a ton of detail here, I don't think, but uh, certainly, you know, in some kind of detail here. But it, it is really, it doesn't really have to be that complicated. I, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this, this whole chart here. I'm not going to say that anything of that specificity, but just in the terms of the difference in the layers and, and, uh, and the difference between these two types of bacteria here. So gram positives, as we mentioned, have the membrane and then the thicker cell wall. Gram negatives have the same membrane. Again, all living things do. They have, instead of a thick cell wall, they have only a single layer of that peptidoglycan. So they have just a very thin single layer of the peptidoglycan. So the brown shows a thicker cell wall with the positives. But over here, we see that same substance, but just in one thin, almost easy to overlook layer. On top of that then, we have what's called the outer membrane. The outer membrane is actually similar to the cell membrane in terms of the composition, but it's slightly different in that it has an extra chemical called a lipopolysaccharide. And a lipopolysaccharide is a combination of a, of a lipid, which is like the lipo, uh, the, the uh, polysaccharide, uh, the phospholipids down here
Okay. Three, two. Okay, so. Three, two, one. So we talked about the gram positives. Let's take a look at the gram negatives. The gram negatives are going to have a cell membrane, just like the gram positives and, and just like all other organisms, like I mentioned. One, one of the key differences is that while they do have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan here, that cell wall consists of only a single layer of peptidoglycan and therefore it's much thinner than the multi-layered thick cell wall and the gram positives. So that's your first fundamental difference, is that gram-positives have the thick multi-layers, multiple layers of peptidoglycan, whereas gram-negatives have only a thin single layer of peptidoglycan. And therefore we have a difference in the, in the, the cell wall uh, that is just outside the, the cell membrane. The, the third key difference, the, other, the next key difference that is, the second key difference, is that gram-negatives have what's called an outer membrane. And this is something that's absent in the gram positives. So we talked about that here. Outer membrane unique only to one type of bacteria discussed next. That is the gram negatives here. Uh, I don't mention as, as much detail about this here, sorry. But uh, the outer membrane is, is an extra layer that's going to help the bacteria filter out extra factors from the environment, things that would otherwise be harmful. It kind of has a unique extra layer of protection that allows it to interact a little differently with the world around it than gram positives. It's not always significant. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And I know that's kind of vague. But in terms of the significance, the gram negative outer membrane is more significant to, to what we want to know about them in terms of how it affects us from a medical standpoint. From an environmental standpoint, that difference is a little more uh, is a little less obvious, that is, and maybe a little less important. So, uh, from a general standpoint, it's an extra layer that kind of helps it, uh, helps protect it, really, is a kind of way to think about it. When we talk about this later, one of the things I'll mention is an example of why it's more harmful is this molecule here called lipopolysaccharide. It actually acts as an antigen that can actually trigger your immune system and lead to an inflama inflammatory reaction. So it can actually make your body become inflamed if, it com if you come in contact with enough of it. So that's like an example of how that is different from a gram positive. Not really fundamental to what it does as a bacteria, but fundamental to how it affects us as human beings who are infected by the bacteria. And that's really what more I want to focus on. So that's, that's kind of a difference in, in how these bacteria would have an effect on us, but uh, not so much of a matter of how it functions. But we have this outer membrane. It's, it's kind of similar to the, the, the phospholipid cell membrane that we talked about down here uh, that all organisms have. This is a similar but slightly different, almost like a hybrid layer of that in which you have phospholipids, but you also have on top of that what's called a lipopolysaccharide layer. And this is what I just mentioned as being somewhat antigenic, uh, causing infl inflammatory reactions in the body or potentially causing that. But it also has this extra uh, unique chemical composition to it. So it's a, a lipolipid, by the way. Let me draw this out here. A lipid, as you may know, is a fat. And then we mentioned earlier a polysaccharide is uh, something with um, lots of sugars. And so here we call it a glycan, which stands for polysaccharide. Polysaccharide actually stands for many sugars is what that translates to. So it's a long kind of a starchy type molecule. So it's, in, in this case, it's a combination of those two. It's a combination of a fat and a kind of a long uh, branch sugar. Okay, so that's your difference between a gram positive and a gram negative. And, uh, and these are the things that you want to look at. What are the layers? So I recognize the cell envelope has three layers. What are some of the basic characteristics of each? And then what's the difference between a gram positive and a gram negative? Okay. Here's another side view between gram positive and gram negative. I apologize, I should have pulled that one up sooner. Uh, there's a blank there to fill that in so that you recognize that gram positives are here on the left and gram negatives here on the right, but then you just really just an extra visual for the three layers here. These are real images here, by the way, uh, with artificial coloring. So it's actually a real microscope image, but with fake coloring to show the layering a little better. 
Okay. Uh, one of the last things I want to get into is just a little bit about what's inside of the cell. Now, if we, get to, if we talk about too much, we open up a can of worms here. So this is um, very, very minimal, and it's really just to kind of list what's there and really not with, with no intention really of explaining exactly what all those things are. And so um, this is where a class like microbiology is, is building on classes like a general biology. Now, not all of you have general biology, but a class like microbiology is intended to build on a class like general biology, whether you've had it or not. So we talk a lot about each of these in general biology, but very little in microbiology because we're building on top of that. So you might go back and reference some of the review material I've left in the resources section if you want to know more about these or just obviously look up stuff online if you want to have a better understanding. But uh, all I want you to know really from, from this class standpoint is kind of what are the things inside of a basic prokaryotic bacterial cell. Again, these are prokaryotes, so they're simple. If you refer back to chapter one, we talked about the difference between a, a prokaryote and a eukaryote, and one of the major differences is the, you know, the internal complexity. So keep that in mind because these are going to be relatively simple compared to a eukaryote. So really what you want to recognize is that inside of a bacterial cell, a large component of it is, is made up of what's called cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is just the liquidy fluid substance that's inside of the cell. Ribosomes are another key factor. Ribosomes are protein synthesizers. They synthesize protein, but they are units that synthesize protein. So all you want to know there is that they, they make protein. That's what they do. And then finally, one of the, the, the third major components of a simple cell like this is the genetic material. And this is a combination of both DNA and RNA. These are a type of what are called nu nucleic acid. So uh, all, the, all living things have DNA and RNA as well as ribosomes, as well as the cytoplasm, as well as the cell membrane. So really what you're looking at here in addition to the cell membrane is a short list of some of the basic features that all living things have. So these are the simplest type of life forms, therefore they're kind of like the minimal representation of what a living thing is made up of. And let's just go back here real quick to that figure we showed earlier. Here's your cytoplasm here in the middle. These little specks are the ribosomes. And then your genetic material is shown here in the middle. These long strands here are what they're referring to, to here as the bacterial chromosome. Sorry. Okay, so that is that is the genetic material there, DNA and RNA within the cell, as you saw there. Uh, mixed in with everything else there. So here's that figure we showed earlier. Uh, just want to give you a quick visual here. The stuff inside the cell is the cytoplasm. The ribosomes are shown here as little specks, and they're kind of floating throughout the cell here. And then the final part is the genetic material, which is shown here as like a big long strand, almost looks like a bowl of spaghetti. That's the genetic material, which is kind of floating here, sitting in a certain part of the cell called the nucleoid. And so you have the, here it's called a bacterial chromosome, that, that's basically your DNA. That's the DNA of the cell condensed here into this little unit called the nucleoid. So to clarify, the nucleoid is actually a location in the cell where the DNA sits and the, the bacterial chromosome is the DNA itself. And the chromosome is a big long strand of the, of the DNA. So here's what that looks like. From a basic view, taking everything else out, you've got the cell membrane, some kind of cell wall here. This would be a gram positive. 
ribosomes often just kind of floating throughout the cell. Here's a slightly bigger view. One of the things they'll, they do is they actually use some of the RNA within the cell, which really wasn't shown in that previous figure and oftentimes isn't in these types of figures. But RNA is, is something that will be produced in the cell and it'll be, it'll be used along with ribosomes to make protein and things like that. So that's kind of where that plays a role. And then the DNA, as I said, is, is usually in one big long strand kind of pushed away into the corner of the cell called the nucleoid. So the nucleoid is kind of the region of the cell where that DNA gets pushed into. Okay, so those are some of the three major parts of a cell. And the last thing is uh, a part of the cell called an inclusion body or, or, or bodies, sometimes even referred to as micro compartments. Inclusion bodies are something that are found in some bacteria and not others and they are basically a, a form of energy storage within a cell. So I add these because I think it's an important attribute some bacteria have and it also highlights a way that some bacteria are able to survive better than others. And that's one of the reasons why I talk it here. There's actually a variety of little things like this that, that, that I didn't add into this topic that I think is just add to it and we've got enough information is one reason why I don't. Also, I don't they're also very specific and they don't always tell us much. Uh, this is something that I think tells us a little bit about bacteria. So it's, it's basically a little storage unit in the cell and what it does is very simple. It allows them to take in extra nutrients when they find themselves in the abundance of food and energy. They can store away some of that excess energy and then if the energy source goes away, goes down, they can start to draw some of those nutrients back out and they can just I like to think of them honestly as like little bacterial fat cells. Okay, it's not a separate cell, it's more of a little compartment, but it does kind of the same thing. Now, why I mentioned this is kind of important is because what this does is it allows the bacteria to survive longer durations without a food source. And one of the things that happens in the environment is a, a food source can come and go pretty quickly. One second there's an abundance and the next second there's a complete absence. And that's because bacteria tend to grow quickly and deplete their resources quickly. So bacteria that can produce a, an inclusion body and utilize a an inclusion body will be more likely to survive those low periods where very little nutrients are present and where other bacteria may, start, may starve out. So this feature is something that would add to the hardiness and the, the durability of microbes when, it, when the environment becomes stressful, which at some point it almost always will for, for most microbes in some way. But in a lot of ways, low nutrients is a, is a potential threat. And so this kind of helps them you know, stave off that, that kind of uh, low point uh, when, the, when the environment is uh, not providing very many nutrients. So when the nutrients then uh, return, you know, they can refill those. So in between time, they can draw off the, the inclusion body and then when the nutrients return, they can refill those. So anyway, that's, that's what those are and that's kind of why they are significant. All right, so we're gonna stop it there. Go ahead and take a look at the next part whenever you're ready. And uh, as always, email me with any questions. I'll talk to you soon.